Hello, good afternoon, and welcome. I'm Justin Briley. This is the time of the week when we engage some of the best thinkers on both sides of the Christian debate. Unbelievable! Every Saturday, part of the Faith Explored range of programming here on Premier Christian Radio. So glad you can join me today. Perhaps you're listening though at some other point in the week via the podcast. Welcome along too, and you can find that at premier.org.uk/slash. Unbelievable. You're unbelievable. Yes, it is round two of how Jesus became God, and uh, so pleased to welcome back to the studio Bart Ehrman and Simon Gathercole. Now, the claim at the heart of the Christian faith is that Jesus of Nazareth was and is God. But in his new book, as we heard last week, How Jesus Became God, New Testament historian Bart Ehrman says that's not what the original disciples believed, and it's not what Jesus claimed about himself. Had a great discussion to start us off last week with my other guest Simon Gather. Cole, who's a New Testament scholar from Cambridge, uh, joins me again today to debate with Bart, continue to debate really this new book. Um, and Simon is one of the authors of a response book coming out at the very same time uh, as uh, Bart's book called How God Became Jesus. And so uh, they're both here again in the studio to talk to me about this whole issue of whether the early Christians turned a human preacher from Galilee into the Son of God. Thanks, guys, for, for coming back again and, uh, and having a second Thank crack you. of the whip on this one. Um, as I mentioned last week, kind of unusual to have uh, a book and its response book coming out at the same time. I mean, certainly there were a few responses to misquoting Jesus, but they all kind of had to wait their turn and wait for the book to be published and then and, and so on. So, so this one was kind of a special arrangement, Bart. Um, you welcome that? You think that's a kind of a, a, a good thing? It's, it's good for scholarship to sort of have, you know two different views coming out at the same time. Well, I do. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the reason to write a book is so that people will deal with important issues. And as I said in the last, uh, in our last episode, the, um, this issue strikes me as fundamentally important for everybody, whether they're a Christian or not a Christian. Historically, it's extremely important to figure out why it is Christians have called Jesus God. And it's obviously a controversial issue. And so a response book that comes out at the same time gets people talking about both sides of the issue. Mm -hmm. And if the point is to get people talking and to be thinking and to be reading, uh, then uh, it's all to the good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you're generally perceived, especially if you like in in evangelical Christian circles. uh, I I called you a thorn in the side of them last week. But but maybe you're you're on the more, as it were, critical end of the more skeptical end when it comes to how we assess the New Testament documents, their reliability and so on. Um, And and those who have read your published work already might be thinking, well, I kind of know where Bart's going to land on this book before I see it. Um, I think someone's even attempted to do a response book without having read the book. (laughs) But but, um, but I think you're saying, actually, you've changed your mind on one or two things in the course of writing this particular book. Is that is that fair to Uh, say? Yeah, on on things that strike me, at least, as uh, significant. It was interesting when I was looking uh, when I first heard about the the response book and I I looked up on Amazon dot com, of course, to see what this is the unofficial response book. No, no, no. no, The 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 official. official, Okay, sorry. Official response book. Uh, the the blurb by whoever wrote the thing for Amazon dot com uh, indicated that this response book was going to be showing that I was wrong in thinking that Jesus was declared God only hundreds of years later. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and that that would be in the response book. So I thought, well, this will be interesting because actually my book doesn't say that Jesus is considered to be God only hundreds of years later. Mm-hmm. Say, uh, you know, a lot of people have this misconception that it was at the Council of Nicaea that people yeah, decided as, as Jesus we were was saying God. Last week, yeah. Which, yeah, which is absolutely wrong. But uh, I did think that Christians didn't come out and call Jesus God for decades after his resurrection, that they that they had a different understanding of Jesus. Okay. And I changed my mind when I wrote this book. So you, you've in that sense, you've you're you're tying the belief in Jesus's deity to closer to the the life of Jesus than than you would have before you started this. Book. Uh, well, it's chronologically closer, but it's not it's not his life. It's his resurrection. Right? Sure. And I don't think it's his resurrection. I think it's it's the belief Obviously, in his resurrection. From your perspective, it's belief in the yeah. resurrection. I yeah. think even from anybody's perspective, you'd have to say that it's not the resurrection that starts Christianity. It's the belief in the resurrection. Because if Jesus had been raised from the dead and nobody knew about it, then obviously you wouldn't have 
Christianity. Yes, yes, I suppose that. So that, it's the that, belief in the resurrection, and the question is, what motivated that belief? And that's where I, I spent a good bit of time in the book trying to show why it is the res- the belief in the resurrection started. Yeah, and and so it's interesting because you know, in as much as you do a, a fair bit of work of, about around that in the book, that is another area where I think people will be interested to see your views distilled a bit as to what you actually believe, because I think some people have said. Uh, in the past, oh well, you uh, Bart Ehrman believes that uh, you know that the traditions of the empty tomb are true, uh, that the um, resurrection appearances uh, of you can vouch say for those and other things. But you, you're kind of saying, well, yeah, I'll take that, but I won't take that, and that sort of thing. Right. I end up. I, this is something else I changed my mind on. I I came to think th- this will be controversial, and and Simon certainly won't agree with this. Uh, <laughs> I I came to think that the traditions about Jesus having a a known tomb that was then discovered to be empty mm. are probably not historical. Uh, that it's the belief in the resurrection hinges completely on the visions. Now, whether whether or not you agree about the empty tomb, it is true that in the New Testament, it's the, the empty tomb doesn't convince anybody to believe. And you can understand why. If somebody goes to a tomb where a body used to be, they don't immediately say resurrection. They say grave robbers, mm-hmm. or they say, "Hey, I'm at the wrong tomb." <laughs> so they don't. So the immediate thought isn't resurrection. It's the visions of Jesus in the New Testament itself that is said to inspire faith in the resurrection. Right. I mean, we're not doing a show on the resurrection today, but um, Simon, were, were you kind of interested to see what Bart was saying in the book? I don't think everything. You, I don't think you anticipated all of his sort no, of absolutely. his, I have, his I have, moves. I have to confess, I have, when I was when I first heard about about the book, you know, partly on the basis of the title, I thought, oh, this is another kind of classic sort of evolutionary tale mm. uh, where, um, d- w- which is just a rehashing of, of, of an old of an old idea um, that one sees, particularly in a book which um, has has the title "From Jewish Prophet to Gentile God" by a mm. former professor of New Testament at uh, Nottingham University, Morris Casey, where um, where 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 Jesus sort of starts off as, yeah. as a, you know starts off as a, a rabbi or, or even a prophet, and then becomes Messiah, mm-hmm. and then becomes Lord and then becomes uh, pre-existent and then becomes God and it's a, it's a sort could, of nice could, could have a similar parallel in more recent works like that of um, the, this uh, um, uh, zealot by um, Razor Aslan in, uh-huh. in as much as he's also believes what you initially got is a Jewish sort of liberation zealot who, yeah. who gets turned into deified into uh, the god of Christianity. Yeah, that's right. So, so yeah, yeah what, what I was anticipating was that you know Jews start, the, the, the the earliest Jewish Christians had a sort of rigid conception of of of, uh, of, of monotheism, uh, and but when you sort of take that, when you get out of the Jewish uh, environment and take Jesus out into the wild and wacky pagan world, then he can be called, become called a god. But the, you know, but Bart's Bart's whole approach to the question uh, is is very different from that, and it was refreshing to. To see a different take on the yeah. on, on, on the on the title. Okay. On the title. Um, well, if you're interested, if you're listening to this uh, this Saturday afternoon and, and you're thinking, "Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I missed that first part." Sounds very interesting. Um, why not go to the web page? Uh, you know where to go: premier.org.uk/unbelievable, and simply subscribe to the podcast or, or click on the link to last week's show, and you'll be able to catch up that way. Um, but maybe you're listening today and, and you've heard part one, and you're you're raring to go for part two, as I am. Uh, so, so that's what we're going to have on today's show. Uh, and today, rather than talking as we did last week about you know Jesus in the gospel so much, we, we're going to start to talk about the way early Christian followers, indeed, um, Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus, as he was originally, started to view Jesus Christ. Because in many ways, gents, I think it's fair to say that those are our earliest sources. Before the, the gospels were written down, I, I, you can give me some timelines here, but I think... Um, some of Paul's letters are, are generally considered to be the earliest source we have of Christian writing. Is, is that true, Bob? Yeah, no, that's right. It's confusing to a lot of Christians because when you read the Bible, you start mm, with Matthew, so you think that's the first one written. But uh, I don't know if Simon and I agree completely on the dates, but usually uh, Mark is thought to be the earliest gospel written, maybe around the year 65 or the year 70, and and Matthew and Mark a decade or a little bit more after that, and John toward the end of the first century. John's yeah, letter. We, we basically you agree, agree on that. that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and Paul's letters are almost certainly written in the 50s. Uh, maybe First Thessalonians would be the first around 49 or so. But, but in any event, Paul's letters are uh, 
15 years, 10, 15, 20 years earlier That's than the Gospels. And, and in terms of their date from the, let's call it belief, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ coming coming out, the we're looking at about 20 years, 20 say, to, 30 years, to, to yeah. the earliest yeah. letters yeah. Of, of Paul and so yeah. 20 on. To 20 to 30, probably. Well, his last letter. I'm oh, so the last, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the total, yeah, yeah, totality yeah, of his yeah, writing. Right, sure, so, but 20, sure. years, yeah. 20 years before his earliest yeah. writings, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, well, we're going to get into that, and, and, and we'll be asking, um, do we do what, what do we get from Paul's writing particularly? And, and the Book of Acts might be another one we might want to touch on as well as in terms of source material for mm. what the earliest Christians believed about Jesus Christ. Christ and, and what kind of status he had in their view. Um, because as we, we talked about last week, it, it is important how this belief arose, when it was established. Uh, was it something that was there from the start? Was it something that developed over time? Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. OK, um... Something that I've often heard in, in my time doing this show when we touched on these kinds of issues is um, <clears throat> Philippians 2. Um, this is often reputed to be Paul quoting in that letter to the Philippians some kind of a, a, a poem or, or, or song or hymn that was going around the early Christian church uh, in which we appear to have, to use the technical term, very high Christology. And I'm sure both of you guys could, could quote to me the, the, what, what's written there. And, and uh, as far as I've understood, that's often been used as an example of, well, here you have um, Jesus being talked about in extremely um, godlike terms really early on, which kind of puts a lie to the idea that, you know, it was, it was 50, 60, 70 years for this kind of belief about him to develop. It, it seems like it was going pretty soon after these events around Jesus' life happened, if, if Paul's quoting something that was already there, if you like, and who knows how close to the earth that might have been. So um, am I right in thinking that? Am I wrong? What's, what's your take on, on that kind of whole, whole aspect of this part? Uh, no, I completely agree. I, uh, well, I, I pretty much agree. <laughs> uh, the, this, this poem in Philippians, which I used to think was a hymn. I, I've, got a, I've got a friend now who's an expert in, in Greek and Roman music who says it can't be a hymn because okay. it doesn't scan properly. Right. But, uh, so I don't know. Maybe the Christians couldn't scan. I don't know. But <laughs> maybe it was a hymn. But it, 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 it is definitely has a poetic feel to it. It's Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Um, Just give us the quote, if you would. Uh, so it talks about Christ, who was in the form of God, uh, who was in the form of God, even though he was in the form, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, becoming a, a slave. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about how he, he died on the cross, mm -hmm. after which God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that's above every name, mm -hmm. that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every, con every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, obviously, different translations in different Bibles might, might put this differently. I'm assuming you're going with what you think is the, the best translation of that. I think that's the NRS. I, I've heard yeah. it said, I think, that the, the beginning of the poem is something like uh, Christ who was in very nature God did not consider uh, equality yeah, with God to be grasped. Really, okay, so is that kind of more dubious kind of way yeah, of yeah, describing Greek, that? That's oh, more dubious. It's, it's more. It's, it's, so, what's it's, your your your? Well, on that on that point, the, the the Greek word is more fair, which simply means as you know, a, a Bart translated form, which is the having the same form as yeah, God. Yeah. Okay. Um, Possibly the most the most controversial point of translation is actually over the grasping bit. Yeah. You know, Jesus was mm. in, the, in the in the very form of God, but did not consider equality with God as something to be well, grasped. Either to be grasped at, which 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 sounds like he doesn't have it, <laughs> um, and and he good for him he didn't grasp a grasp after it or or uh, he didn't consider it as something to be exploited in other words he has it right he has equality with but god didn't, but he didn't wasn't take gonna advantage sort of hang of on it. to that yeah. in some way exactly. that would would not enable yeah. him to step down from that throne yeah. to be incarnated sort it's, of thing. it's debated think, yeah. because of the word itself i mean it's yeah. a word that isn't used very and and is this um, another reason why people think paul's quoting something from earlier because it has aspects of it that aren't typical Paul, if you like, in that sense, elsewhere in his writings? Or, or what, what makes them, us them think that he's quoting something rather than writing something f fresh from himself, if you like, in, in that poem in Philippians? Uh, in, that, in that, yeah, well, I, the vocabulary is one factor. So, yeah. so um, uh, often, often when scholars are trying to identify 
when Paul is not just not just in a nice sort of mm. poem like this or or pseudo poem or semi poem mm. like this, uh, but even in just little little snippets. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the appeal is made to you know, strange yeah. vocabulary that Paul doesn't use elsewhere. I mean, the, the difficult the the, I don't, the difficulty of course in doing this is that you know the the, the whole corpus of Paul's letters is tiny. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, the, to say that well, Paul doesn't use this word elsewhere. We don't know what he might have been writing yeah, else yeah, in his other letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, but on the face of it, then a, a pretty good indicator that the early Christians did seem to hold Jesus in very high regard as equal with God, or is that not quite what you would draw out of Philip? Okay. So, uh, this is I, th- I imagine Simon and I are going to disagree on this point. So. Um, <laughs> My view of this is that it's trying to say that before Jesus became a human, um, he was he had he was a divine being with God in heaven, uh, but he didn't want to seek equality with God. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to grasp after something that wasn't his. Uh, he he didn't want equality with God. Instead, he emptied himself and became a slave. And as a slave, he died on the cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him. And I think what happens is God exalts him more highly than he was before, because now at the name of Jesus, every knee, every tongue, will, at the name of Jesus, every, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Yeah. This is a quotation from the book of Isaiah mm-hmm. that says, only to Yahweh, only to the God of Israel, will every uh, knee bow and every tongue confess. So that God now has exalted Jesus to his own level, to his own. So so there is now, after the resurrection, an equality with God that okay. there wasn't before. In the sort of Johannine sense. Uh, 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 so, yeah, yeah, so in a sense, yeah, that, yeah. that very poem for you is illustrating <laughs> The, what, the kind of evolution that took place in the minds of, of Christians, that it was because of what happened in his earthly life and his resurrection that we can now say of Jesus, he is co-equal with Yahweh, the, the God of Israel. Right. So it gets a little complicated, which is why it takes a whole book to try and explain it. But, but the basic idea I have is that in, in the Greek and Roman worlds, there were ideas that some human beings were made divine. Mm. Uh, Romulus, uh, Apollonius of Tiana, they, they become divine. Uh, by being exalted, there are other there are other stories in the Greek and Roman world where a divine being becomes a human. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in one case, you have an exaltation of a human to divinity, and the other, you have the incarnation of a divinity into into a human. And I think uh, I think John, for example, has the incarnation view, and I think the Synoptic Gospels have the exaltation view. And Paul, this hymn that Paul's quoting is a combination of the two. Mm-hmm. Jesus does start out as a divine being, but he's not equal with God. It's only after the resurrection that he gets exalted to an even higher position where he's equal with God. What's your take on, on the Philippians passage then, as, as Bart's explained it? I, I, I think I, I think we agree about this. I think we probably agree about the second part of the, <laughs> the hymn that uh, God is uh, God exalted Jesus to as 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 the strange Greek word puts it, super exalts mm. uh, Jesus to a position where he's above every every heavenly and earthly uh, and under sub you know, sub earthly knee oh. <laughs> um, and tongue um, and um, uh, uh, I suppose what, where where I disagree on the second point is that it's the the point of the hymn is not so much is not is not that uh god exalted him to a place where he wasn't what before. wasn't before but that he exalted him above all these other powers right. mm. um and so i i i i take the, the the first hymn the first half of the hymn to uh refer to i mean I, I, to, to me the evidence that um the the evidence for this you know uh complicated word about grasping to me to to me it's i i I find it convincing that the the phrase means uh equality with god is something you know something jesus didn't want to hold on to and and therefore Um, had yeah and therefore was willing to release if you like i mean i think i I think obviously treating a sort of little hymn like this in isolation is 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 difficult and so inevitably we're going to have to go elsewhere yeah to see i think one of the main I, 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 perhaps we want to say more about this, and so I'll just well, mention this briefly. But one of the main places where, where um, we see Jesus having a, an extremely exalted position in in Paul's mind before the resurrection is all the way back in creation. I mean, one of the most remarkable things that we touched on last week is is 
the prologue to John's gospel saying, through him were all things made and without mm. him was not anything made that was made. That is an amazing thing to say. Um, but um, Paul also shares, you know, right at, the, right at the beginning of the New Testament documentary history, Paul also shares this idea that Jesus was with the Father involved in creation. You know, he hadn't been called Jesus mm, yet, but mm. he was Lord, uh, Lord of everything and through him... Uh, uh, all things, all things exist. Where is that? Uh, One Corinthians eight six. I'm thinking of particularly. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yes, I should have. Uh, <laughs> I know Bart knows where it is. He's prompting me to do the reference for listeners. Yeah, one, so One Corinthians eight six. For, for us, there is one God, the Father, mm. from whom all things come and for whom all things exist. Yeah. Uh, there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things come and through whom. Yeah. Uh, we, so, we so exist. this this theology of the pre-existent Christ mm -hmm. there with God as part of the Godhead yeah. from the beginning. Um, there in, as far as you can see, Paul's writing, Paul writing pretty soon after the events of Jesus' yeah, life. Yeah. And so for you, again, confirmatory evidence that this belief Paul has already picked up from someone else, presumably. It's, it's out there. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's kind of been developing and, and that Paul is inventing in any sense. Yes, I, I think it's difficult to, to argue that, and I don't think Bart uh, takes this, for example. I think he thinks that here Paul is tapping into something uh, pre Paul line. I think the, re the reason why it can't really have easily been invented by Paul is that one finds the very same phrasing, um, very similar phrasing in John, very similar phrasing in Hebrews, mm -hmm. uh, very to, to the phrasing that one finds in in one Corinthians and also in Colossians. Uh, you know, these four places are are unlikely all to have been uh, derived from 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 Pauline teaching. Yeah, I think the point though is not it's not so much that. Gosh, this is this. This shows Jesus is pre-existent. The point is that Jesus is on the. You know, when we, when we were talking about uh, last week about the line mm. between deity and and, and non-deity. Um, I mean, I think I, I I think one one point where Bart and I would disagree is that I think that there is a firmer line, mm. and that what marks out the entities on either side of the line is that that God is the creator. Mm -hmm. and everything else is created uh so for example in 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 romans one paul says what what is the fundamental sin the fundamental sin is idolatry it's worshiping a created thing rather than the rather creator. than the creator mm. so paul has the paul has a very rigid line mm. between between deity and non-deity and if Between jesus what, was what, just an exalted angel that would equally be as anathema to paul to worship an exalted angel as yeah, to so worship an idol exactly so, so if, if, if if jesus is a creature then you jolly well really shouldn't worship him because because if jesus is a creature to worship him is idolatry it's worshiping a so, created so thing paul, rather than the creator. from that perspective has for you the the highest sort of view of, of jesus's divinity not just a sort of angelic being type of view but but that this is firm yes that's right know, i mean uh, only, uh, yeah. uh, that reminds me of a of a statement um made by an old oxford professor uh long long gone now but who was a professor in the 1970s in commenting on the uh the philippians hymn here uh he stated that this is evidence that this is george cared uh who, who said this he, he said that the the highest the, the the early the highest christology of the new testament is the earliest right. uh this philippians yeah. hymn is is yeah. is one of our earliest testimonies and the highest too and but uh, yeah responses on that then um Yes, I have lots of responses. <laughs> so I'm deciding which ones to make. <laughs> well, I'll tell you that in, in this section, um, before we go to a break, you've got about three minutes. So okay. choose choose one and then we'll do some more um, up, after the I, break. I think uh, my, my view is that um, Paul did understand Jesus to be a pre-existent being. Um, I, I don't know whether Paul thought that Christ was the creator of the universe. Um, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 does not, to me, say that. Uh, the verse says that all things came from God and lead to God. Mm. So God is the all in all. But all things exist through Jesus as we exist through Jesus. So I don't think that's saying that, uh, that Christ created everything. I think it's saying that Christ as the Lord of the universe now is sovereign over all and provides us with our being. Mm. Uh, I don't think it's talking about creation when it refers to Christ. If it is referring to creation Christ, I, it wouldn't really affect my view very much because um, 
my my view is that there were Jews who thought that there was a being that helped God create the universe based on Proverbs chapter 8, where wisdom is understood to have been the one through whom God created the universe. Okay. And so if if Paul does understand it that way, then he understands Christ as a kind of a wisdom a wisdom figure. I I agree actually with Simon that there's a line between the creator and everything else. Mm. But I think that there is um there's a lot of fuzziness in how people imagine this in the ancient world. There were Jews who thought that it was pro- appropriate to worship angels. Um, we know there were Jews who thought this because there are constant prohibitions of it. Uh, and so the fact that there, you prohibit something that's that's going on. So the Jews who believed in worshiping angels obviously uh, lost out in the struggle about how to define theology. But even Jews agreed that there are superhuman beings up in heaven. There are angels, there are archangels, there are cherubim, there are seraphim, there are principalities, there are powers. These are divine beings. Uh, they're not God. They're not the creator. So there's a difference between the creator and these other divine beings. And you think Jesus is more likely to be being referred to as one of these super, for Paul, di- super for divine Paul, beings? For Paul, Jesus was one of these other super divine beings, probably the head of them the all, head of them all, who became uh, a human, and then God exalted him even higher to a status equal with himself. Mm. And he would have been happy to encourage people to worship that kind of thing, even though it still wasn't quite... Yes, just just as other Jews believed, for example, that the Son of Man should be worshipped along with God. There's a whole strain of Judaism that thought that there was a second power enthroned with God up in heaven that was Mm. also worthy of worship. Well, we'll get a response from Simon on that in a moment, but uh, if perhaps uh, you want to respond, I'm going to give you the ways to do that again in a moment's time. This is Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley, the second of two Theological, biblical shows asking, uh, did the early Christians turn a human preacher, Jesus from Galilee, into the Son of God? And and we're kind of getting down to what the earliest Christian sources said about him, um, the the Christology, to give it its technical term, in uh, Paul's letters and and other places in the Bible. So uh, do stay with us. Come back again in a moment's time and we'll continue today's discussion. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Reading through the book, Simon, that uh, you're part of the response book, um, Michael Bird, who's the overall sort of coordinator for the book, um, he, he, he's got quite an interesting style in the way he uh, talks about Bart and, and uh, his line of theology and so on. But Have you what, read the book, Bart? Yes, I have. Read the yes, yes. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, he, what, at one point he talks about the early high Christology club. Uh, I don't know how hard it is to get into this club, but um, <laughs> it includes people like Larry Hurtado, Richard Borkham and so on. I assume you would put yourself in as part of that. Yes, that unfortunately, club. I haven't got one of the mugs. Which I would <laughs> there, there are so, actual mugs. There are mugs. Club. Yeah, there are mugs, which wow. are real, the real badges of membership. <laughs> <laughs> Bart's not in the club, I don't think. Um, but um, th- I mean... Th- this is what we're talking about at this point, this, this idea that, that there is a segment of scholarship which believes that there was a very high Christology. And by high Christology, we're talking about equating Jesus with God, one and mm-hmm. the same thing. He shares in the identity of the God of Israel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know Richard Borkham himself has written a whole book on this as well, Jesus and the God of Israel. I'll, I'll post links to that as well from today's show um, because we, he came in to talk with James Crossley about that in the past on, on this programme. But the um, w- what's your problem then with what Bart's saying about um no it's more likely there were other types of theology going around wasn't impossible for angels to be worshipped um you know you have all these other things feeding into this you know stories about God becoming human and humans becoming gods and so on uh or at least divine beings uh so so Bart sees a lot more fuzziness where you see quite this clear line um, uh, in the writings of Paul, um, yes, I mean I, I wouldn't dispute a lot of what Bart has said in his in his chapter about uh, about Jewish monotheism, about uh, there being you know, some texts where uh, there are there are what might seem you know, to, to the average reader sort of surprising things. You know, Philo of Alexandria, a, a almost exact contemporary of Paul, uh, writing about how Moses becomes you know really jolly like God mm, and, uh, mm. gradually and eventually. Very much like, very much like God, and uh, the Son of Man is is his Son of Man figure is is worshipped by the kings of the earth in uh, the possibly first century 
apocalypse that we know of as uh, as one Enoch. Uh, so there 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 there, is, there are certainly in some circles of Judaism um, fuzziness. Mm-hmm. Um, whether one can then generalize about ancient Judaism as a whole as being fuzzy, I think is a, is a, is 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 a questionable point. Uh, and one of the, one of the, I think one of the pieces of evidence for this actually is the New Testament, because it seems to me that the New Testament actually is an inheritor of a pretty strict monotheism. Mm-hmm. Uh, whatever whatever. Philo might have been doing in Alexandria and whatever sort of perhaps rather strange Jewish mystics might have been doing in the desert in Qumran. Uh, um, the, 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 the Judaism of which the New Testament authors are the heirs uh, seems pretty strict. So we, we've seen that, for example, in the pericope or paragraph about Jesus forgiving sins. I don't, I don't want to go over the old yeah, ground yeah, that we went yeah. into last week, but, uh, but they seem to take take a strict view yeah and not, paul himself you can't just go around himself, saying you yeah. forgive sins because yeah. that's blasphemy no one can forgive sins and paul describes himself as being of the sort of strictest variety of jew as well yes uh, yeah that's right and i suppose uh, it, but it's not just it's not just paul the sort of you know strict the strict one again in in in, in revelation there's a there, there's a very clear line mm. you jolly well mustn't worship an angel yeah you you can worship you worship god not an angel mm. angels are fellow creatures Again, there's that uh, um, yeah. there's mm. that line. So, uh, I think this this line between uh, creator and creature, creator and creation, is one that permeates the New Testament because the New Testament writers were inheritors of that strict kind of Judaism. Uh, again, so jolly well, don't worship the created a, a created thing. That's idolatry. If you worship a created thing, you know mm. that's very bad news so i can't imagine that paul would have thought that jesus was a a, a being who was created by god even if he was the top most even if being. he's the top top created thing he's still a created thing I and mean, there's there, there's a there's a line there um and again i think that comes out in the in the in the passage it, that um uh that, that bart mentioned uh isaiah chapter 45 which is the background to uh, the philippians hymn where all the way through that chapter uh, in Isaiah 45, you have, I am the Lord, there is no other. There's no one like me. There are no, there are no, mm. there are no other gods. I am the only mm. one. To me, every knee will bow, and uh, uh, and to me alone, mm. every tongue will confess that I am, uh, I am the Lord. Um, so, uh, so Paul's use of that passage yeah. shows that he, you know, he's he 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 very much affirms that that line. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're not actually disagreeing very much because I agree that that there were a number of Jews who who had this, what what Simon's calling a strict monotheism. Uh, The reason the situation was fuzzy within Judaism wasn't because some people were individually fuzzy. It's because some people had that view and Mm -hmm. other people had other views. And so the overall picture is somewhat fuzzy. Mm -hmm. I agree that the authors of the New Testament were on the side that that there there is a creator and everything Mm -hmm. else is below the creator. Um, where we differ is where Jesus stands in that whole, in that array. And my view is that precisely because God exalted Jesus to his own status, that's why Paul thought it was so amazing, because this line had been breached by God himself. God had taken a divine being and exalted him to his own level, and Paul is in astonishment at this, uh, and he falls down on his knees to worship because of this, hmm. uh, this is this is the exaltation. So, so this is Paul kind of going against everything he would normally think about worshiping which is creative what, beings, which is and, and doing so, and about everything else. I mean, when Paul converts, he can. I mean, he changes his views, uh, and this is one of the things he changed his views about. Now we have somebody that has been exalted to the divine status, and. Uh, it, Paul realizes this, and it completely. So, so Bart's thing is: this is exaltation. Mm. This is not a kind of um, statement of Jesus already having that, mm. if you like. That that. Why why do you believe it's not just exaltation the, the, that we're the, talking the about? The problem with that is that wouldn't wouldn't that mean that God made a create a, a creature into a into an un, into a non creature that, that, that yes. is not just exalting him to a different status it's sort of rewriting the history of, yeah I know I, I know I made Jesus in the past but I, I let's not think about that anymore let's no think he's about not him. making him into a non creature he's still a creature but he's a creature who's now been exalted to the level of God it's like when a Roman emperor adopts a son uh, the son wasn't born to the emperor the son is born to someone else but the emperor now names him his heir this is mm. this is how uh, Octavius became 
became the adopted son of Julius Caesar. Mm. Julius Caesar had another son that nobody's ever heard of, his son with Cleopatra, a natural son. Octavius wasn't his natural son. He got adopted to be his son, and so he changed his status so that even though he wasn't his naturally born son, he came to inherit everything that Caesar had. He was his sole heir, mm. and that's what God has now done with Jesus. But that would mean him. That that would mean a a created thing becoming. When Paul is opposing, st- stopping be, being a created thing. Yes, when Paul opposes idolatry in Romans one, he's not talking about that. He's talking about pagans who are worshiping idols. Nobody's making idols of Jesus. Uh, Paul is saying that there's only one God, and that's the one to be worshipped. But he also says that now he's exalted Jesus to that level so that he too can be worshipped. But you're saying that Paul regarded Jesus as as created by God, as a supreme angel who all was things created. Are, for Paul, all things are created by God. Yeah, so including including Jesus. Including all the angels. Okay. I mean, is so, this just where you simply diverge with Bart and you just don't think that the, the text supports that? I mean, otherwise, you have to say moment. that he's not right when he says that, uh, that from whom are all things. Well, if all things are from him, then so is Christ. But I think the, the, the immediate, the, the statement immediately following that, all things, all things are through Christ. They exist now through Christ because he's the sovereign Lord who, who sustains the entire universe. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> what, what, what are you not following on that then, Simon? What, what's the, I mean, is this just that it doesn't make sense for Paul, this, you know, strict Jew, to even countenance the idea that God would allow a created being to to attain the same status as him and, and therefore be worthy of worship and so on uh-huh. that just doesn't compute in your yeah your I, I, I fully of... accept that in romans one paul is talking about a specific yeah. brand, brand of idolatry but uh, i mean i mean it, it, it reflects his his view that that you worship the creator not the created things and that's one of the sort of marks of the, uh, that's one of the marks of God that makes him worshipable, to put it to put it, to put it cr- crudely. And uh, I, I mean, I think we also dis- just disagree about one Corinthians eight six. That I don't think that there's a sh- there's a, sh- a very sharp distinction between uh, God from whom all things come and 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 the Lord through whom all things <laughs> come. That, that, you know, both of those are create that, both of those are creation language rather than just rather than simply talking about so, Jesus, so role G- in the present. Jesus you feel in that Corinthians passage is being given the role of a creator God in that sense yeah the, he, the language he's, he's the la- spoken of in one and the same phrase as God yeah the, the language of through him all things coming is is the same that we find in 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 John 1 uh, about create about creation it's the same thing we find the mm-hmm. same language we find in in Hebrews 1 about creation and Colossians 1 about creation yeah. this isn't merely merely constantly sustaining the universe in the present i mean, I mean obviously you guys just did differ on on this issue <laughs> uh, it's a fe- fairly significant i suppose in its way but but some people might be thinking well but i mean y- nonetheless even if you you know go down the route of jesus in paul's view your best guess is that he was still an exalted angel of some kind a uh, very powerful um equal with god eventually um it's still it's still in some sense high christology that yes. we're talking mm. about. Yeah. So, so, so maybe some, you should be in this club. I'm, but I think Bart could, could get into the club. So, some some <laughs> yeah, people yeah. are saying that yeah. I've joined the club. Uh, so, um, and, but, m- but my point is the significant one, that this view was not the view that Jesus himself was pronouncing okay. or that his earliest followers. This is something that comes about after Christians come to believe in the resurrection. And, and this brings us to this so-called tunnel period. I think that's the, the, the phrase that's used in, in your book, <laughs> uh, Simon. The, the idea that there was, you know, a couple of decades between Jesus's life and, and these early writings. And so for you, that's the period in which this view of Jesus, this high view of Jesus, though not quite as high as, as Simon's, um, does crystallize um, between the accounts of the resurrection and, and the writings of Paul. But, right. I mean, I think I think right away, as soon as somebody believes in the resurrection, they believe that Jesus has been exalted to the divine realm. So I don't think it takes 20 years. I think, okay. I think this... It's understandable that that would have been an immediate assumption yeah. on the part of the... the I think the, the issue with the tunnel period, for people who, who aren't familiar with this language, is that if, if Paul is our first author, and so just to round up, just, just say his first letter is in the year 50, mm-hmm. and say, say Jesus died in the year 30, mm-hmm. there's 20 years that's unaccounted for. Okay. And how do we know what was happening during those 20 years? Mm-hmm. 
Now, the traditional way of answering that is to say, well, the book of Acts tells us what was happening during that period because the book of Acts begins with the, right after the resurrection of Jesus and traces the history of Christianity for the next uh, yeah. 30 uh, years or so. Yeah. Uh, and so you can just go to the book of Acts. But there are problems with saying that the book of Acts gives us that information because the book of Acts itself was, was written, written after much later. Sure. So probably f I usually date Acts to 80 to 85. There are a lot of people now dating Acts to the year 120, which I think is too late. But, but e even Acts has lots of tunnels in it where you've yes. got t times, you know, <laughs> yeah. exactly. a, a decade. Which yeah. is and Acts isn't, isn't trying to set out exactly what the disciples believed every year in this tunnel period. Sure. But, Much but as us biblical scholars would love to have them to have done that, they, they unfortunately... It would be didn't. great. I mean, we, <laughs> all of us, all of us would be ecstatic if a source would show up telling us what was going on in those 20 years. But, but we don't have it. And so um, what I try to do in the book is something that I didn't come up with. This isn't, mm -hmm. like, this isn't my find. Okay. Uh, this, this has been around for a very long time. Scholars have long recognized that there are portions of the New Testament that are being quoted. We talk about the Philippians hymn. Yeah. It existed before Paul. Uh -huh. There are other mm -hmm. passages in Paul and in the book of Acts that look like a, a poem of some kind, a creed may, maybe is being quoted, and it's plausible that, that these things go back to the tunnel. So period. it's a bit of detective work here to see, well, what is Paul or whoever using that's yes. already around? Okay. And and for, for your view, some of these um, bits tend to show that there was a development of some kind, that, that there were, it was like um, different views were being argued yes. about, whether was it an ad adoptionist, was it yes. exaltation? I mean, as an example, um, in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it looks like Paul is quoting an earlier creed mm. for the reasons you were mentioning earlier, that there there's some vocabulary there that mm. seems uncharacteristic of Paul. It seems to be structured, uh, highly structured, um, it, it, it looks like a creed that's being quoted. And in this creed, uh, it, we're told that Jesus descended from, David, from the seed of David according to the flesh, but that he was appointed to be the son of God in power at the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So, so that for you, that's a like, confirmation of this resurrection hypothesis. Well, so I think this yeah. is a pre-Pauline creed that he's quoting. He's quoting it to the Romans because he's writing the book of Romans to get on the good side of the people that he's writing to because he doesn't know mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. He's never been to Rome. He didn't start the church. And he's trying to get them on. So he's quoting a familiar creed. But this familiar creed presupposes, in my judgment, an exaltation Christology that it's precisely at the resurrection that Jesus was appointed to be the okay. Son of God. Yeah. Now, now your view, Simon, is that um, the resurrection was important, sure, mm. but that the view that Jesus was God is found, you could establish from before the resurrection, as it were. It's not something that was assigned to Jesus at the resurrection in the way that, that Bart's talking about. Presumably. Yeah, I think on the on this on this particular case, I think I think one thing that one thing one has to bear in mind with these uh, these formulae, these creeds, is that there's a degree of speculation involved, and you know, as you say, it's detective work, and it's not just <laughs> it's not finding DNA fingerprints, but it's it's a bit more un, mm. un, uncertain than that. But, I, but I, I'm, I'm happy to okay. I'm happy to think that you know there's a good chance that this may be this may be a creed. Um, but I, I, I would dispute whether it presents something radically different from Paul's own Paul's own thought, because I mean, Paul, of course, doesn't take this adoptionist no. view. And so, in some sense, in, in one sense, you might think, it, you know, even off the bat, um, it would, oh, it's a bit strange for Paul to include something that he doesn't he doesn't agree with if he if he uh, if he if he uh, um, really doesn't yeah, take sure. the same view as this Paul as, as this pre-Pauline creed, and so. That that would be one thing that would lead me to question mm. whether this creed tells us about a, 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 a pre-Pauline adoptionist Christology, yes. which, which is what this re resurrection thing is. I mean, yeah. so so you feel that Bart's case is getting a bit shaky if he's basing it on an inference from yeah, these, it's, these I mean, particular it's a, passages. It's a, it's a it's a reasonable inference to say it's a pre-Pauline formula. It's then much more speculative, I would say, um, to do what Bart does, which is to say certain stuff comes from the pre-Pauline formula, but Paul has added the in power. Because, of okay. course, the, the, the second clause is that Jesus, that, that Jesus was appointed to be son of God in power by virtue of his mm. resurrection um, from, 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 from the dead. And, and I think that, that, that in power is important because, because it shows that Paul isn't, isn't just saying that Jesus is adopted, but that something 
uh, something interesting happens, something right. something something more than just adoption yes. uh, um, is involved with at the resurrection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So uh, a couple things about that. One is that this phrase in power, I mean, it, I, I don't think we can have it both ways. I mean, if if you want to say that Paul, that I, it's not that I'm saying that Paul's quoting something he doesn't agree with, mm-hmm. because the way he quotes it, he agrees with it. Mm-hmm. At the resurrection, Christ becomes the son of God in power. Uh, but he did, wasn't the son of God in power before that, because that's when he gets appointed to be the son of God in power. So... This fits in with Paul's Christology, that Christ was a divine being who at the resurrection was exalted to the very level of God himself. The reason for thinking the creed didn't originally have the words in power isn't just because that happens to fit my argument. Uh, This this has been an argument that's been around since the 1950s, uh, and it's because if you lay out this creed and you actually look at the words and you set it up in a poetic structure, so that this statement, this statement, mm-hmm. that statement, mm-hmm. the word, every statement has a parallel. There, there's, two, there's two sections of this okay. creed, and there are three statements <clears throat> in each section, and every statement in the first section corresponds to a statement in the second section, okay. except for the words in power. So that looks like a, an interpolation on the top part of Paul. Yeah, um, which makes it then perfectly acceptable to him as as a statement of what he 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 himself thinks. Yeah, but he, he yeah, but he just slightly tweaked, as it were, the, 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 the thing. But you're not convinced that that necessarily stacks up. You you think that that the in power could have been there already, or do you think probably it wasn't? And but Paul was just sort of clarifying for. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 scholars who scholars who who think that this um, is a pre-Pauline creed d- d- differ over over whether the the in power was there already. And some, so, some, for example, you know, my my old PhD supervisor uh, James Dunn uh, thought that uh, it must have been there originally because it's it, it's not sufficient to contrast. Um, there's not much of a contrast between Son of David and Son of God because Davidic Davidic Messiah. Just, it, it's the son of God anyway, so mm-hmm. so you need that you'd need that in power to uh, right. to, yeah. to to draw a contrast between the pre and post resurrection yeah. uh, identity of Jesus. Uh, if you are if you do want to draw that that kind of contrast, I think I think also I mean it, it just seems to me that um, you know one one way of reading it is just a very straightforward one. Bef- before the resurrection in his earthly ministry, uh, Jesus was weak and and helpless and and died on died on a cross. Now, so now he's exalted to the to the highest place. Yeah, so the, con- the contrast. I mean, is there's, not ju- there's no doubt that everywhere in the Gospels, it, there's a clear distinction between the Jesus's nature before and after yeah. the resurrection. Yeah. So, so in that sense, I think that's right. One one of the things in the, that happens happens in the exaltation is that Jesus is no longer subject to the limitations and weakness that he was subject to in his earthly ministry. But you don't think that that necessarily entails, and that's when they got this idea about Jesus being divine. Bart obviously believes that it was the belief in the resurrection mm-hmm. that made people start believing Jesus was God or something close to God. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, you're saying, well, no, they just saw that as a, a very important marker on the journey. But, but it wasn't as if they didn't believe he was God before that point as well. Yeah, that's right. And, and on, on this particular point of the, of the tunnel period, I think it's, it, it's difficult to identify places where there was a lower Christology, which later becomes raised Mm. In the, okay. Uh, in so, the, when so, the actual New Testament writers come to put pen to paper, you, so yeah. you might be gaining access to this high Christology club we were saying earlier, Bart. Um, yes. <laughs> um, if you just tweak slightly some of your, <laughs> your ideas on, the, the, uh, you'll even right. get a mug by the sounds of it right, um, right. as an honorary member. But uh, I yeah. mean, it's, so the, the other thing though is, I mean, my my case doesn't rest on whether two words in Romans chapters one, sure, three, and sure. four. Uh, there, there are other pre-literary traditions that all point in the same direction. And so w- one of my chapters is trying to show how this is this this does seem to be an understanding of Jesus early on mm. in the pre-literary mm. phase and that it it gets it gets worked out so that it it ends up past Christians end up coming up with a different understanding. Yeah, okay. My chapter in the book is precisely on that. <laughs> right. <laughs> that yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um maybe b- just before we go to to a break. Um I guess my other question is on this. Um it was startlingly um unusual for this affirmation of of, of Christ's you know uh, equality with God to to be made in the culture that it was coming out of presumably. I mean, do do you accept in that sense that um 
something pretty major had to have happened in the life of these followers of Christ to be to start talking about him in that way, even if you're not you wouldn't go as far as Simon does. Well, I would I would say that it it was uh, there had to be something big to make it happen to Jews living in rural Jews living in Palestine. I mean, it wouldn't have been that remarkable for Philo to come up with something like this. Mm-hmm. I mean, he calls Moses the second God. OK. And, the, and there are you know, there are Jewish texts that talk about a second divine being who deserves worship. Mm. So but for these rural Jews living in Palestine, I think they have a fairly traditional view of things, and something big had to happen, and it's the fact they come to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Once they have visions of Jesus after he died, they start drawing the conclusions, and they're remarkable conclusions. I mean, so Christianity starts with a big bang. Mm, It does. Uh, And in that sense, you know, the only difference for you is is obviously that they were illusions or... um, What's hallucinations. The word? hallucinations. I, I actually don't thought. take a stand on that in the book. I don't. I don't yeah. say that I think they're hallucinations. I say that if you are a believer, you would say that Jesus appeared to these people. If you are not a believer, you'd say they're yeah. hallucinations. But in either event, they're, they're, these visions happened. Yeah, um, which in a sense um, is potentially good news, if you like, for the, the evidence for the resurrection. Now, I'm not saying that gives you evidence of a physical resurrection in in your view, Bart, but presumably for you, Simon, do you see the whole, this issue around Christ's divinity as being a a sort of pointer back towards this resurrection-shaped hole, if you like, in in the early church, where we need something to explain why suddenly these very radical views about Jesus were were coming from? I mean, absolutely. I think, I think, I think, now, everyone thinks that you have to have some kind of big bang because because if it, if there wasn't if there wasn't something then christianity would have the jesus movement would have fizzled out just like mm. the theudas movement fizzled out and just like the judas the galilean movement fizzled out to to to, to cite two other yeah. um s- sort of messianic or semi messianic movements uh and so so yes yeah certainly something had to happen which 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 uh, which kept uh kept the movement alive mm. well we're going to be wrapping up the final of these uh, two shows that we've had Simon Gathercole and Bart Ehrman on for. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Well, thanks again to uh, Bart Ehrman and Simon Gathercole, uh, who joined me for the second time this week. And uh, it's been great to spend a, such a, a long time in both your company, though it always flies by. I think you were saying, Simon, once we got halfway <laughs> through today's programme, you were like, oh, half an hour gone already. But um, time flies when you're having fun, as they say. But we've obviously actually only touched on, you know, bits and pieces from your new book. Um there's obviously other things that, that you reveal in the book. Um, do you want to kind of give a more of a general impression of other bits to look out for if people pick this up? Um, I'll just say a very quick word about how it begins and ends, because I think it's important to put any discussions of of how it is the Christians came to think of Jesus as God in the context of the world they live in, which mm. is the Roman Empire. And so I spend a couple of chapters talking about what Greeks and Romans thought about the divine in relationship to the human, and what, what Jews thought about the relationship with the divine and the human. And there's some surprises there. There are things that mm. I didn't expect to find, and I think that a lot of readers won't expect to find. On the other end, the book isn't just about the New Testament. I actually trace what happens after the New Testament period for the next several centuries, Mm. because Christians did develop their understandings of Jesus, and there were a lot of uh, views that came to be declared as heresies. Uh, It's important to understand what these were and why people held them, and how it is that the views that emerged in the fourth century, how those emerged and why they emerged, and why they continued to be controversial even after the fourth century. And so that's what the rest of the book does then. Okay. Um, and who knows? Um, I'm sure you'll be uh, writing responses as well to the, the response book on the <laughs> blog. Um, if, if you want to find out more, it's bartairman.com, I think, isn't it? Yeah, Bart D. Uh, Bart D. Uh, to find out more. Um, so is Bart shaking the foundations of Western civilization, uh, in your view, Simon? Uh, should Christians be worried about this book? I mean, lots of people were, quote unquote, you know, concerned about misquoting Jesus and, and whether Bart was, you know, going to undermine a lot of key Christian beliefs. Uh, 
what, what's your overall take on on the book and and whether he's managed to do that this time round? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think in a way he's he's aiming to undermine Christian beliefs as he as he as he put it earlier. But I, I mean, I think, but also on the history, I think we 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 dis, we, we disagree on a number mm. of points. I mean, I, I think a lot of the stuff that Bart was just alluding to uh, in the in the later chapters is is quite helpful actually. I mean, I think I, I found it found his formulations of things helpful in terms of the Trinitarian par- paradox and mm-hmm. the Christological paradox, the paradox of how Jesus uh, can can be God when the Father is also God, uh, and, and the Christological paradox, mm-hmm. how Jesus can be both God and, and, and man, as in the traditional um, formulations. Um, but as I said earlier, I, th- I do think that the, 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 the seeds of those uh, much more technical formulations with discussions of essence and person mm. uh, the seeds of those more c- complex technical formulations go back to the new testament and uh, uh, and, and not just to uh, certain parts of the new testament but right through the new testament and even mm. into uh, in, into the synoptic gospels where we uh, find uh, the same tension where jesus acts like the god of the god of the old testament uh, and it claims things which are mm. only true of the god of the old testament uh, but is also a, a, a weak and frail human being as well we're going to have to leave it there but uh, it's been really interesting thanks again for your time gentlemen and uh, as i've mentioned already do go uh, check out the books for yourself um, both being released at the same time uh, they're, they're already available now if you want to go online and order them links as ever from the unbelievable web page to those uh, premier.org.uk slash unbelievable and of course i'll make sure to link to the blogs of both uh, bart and uh, the, the, i think um you're sort of involved are you on the um uh, the Evangelion blog and that kind of thing that Michael i'm not Bird that's writes. mike bird's mike bird's blog, blog okay yeah. Yeah. yeah but um i'm sure mike and others will be posting links to this and and to the books and so on so um Thanks very much again for being with me, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. It's been Thank re- you. really interesting discussion. Very well matched uh, opponents. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Justin Briley. You're listening to Unbelievable. Unbelievable with Justin Briley.